Uh, thanks, Greg. Um, when I came to Scotland before the vast majority of you were born, apart from possibly Craig. <laughs> well, that's not so good. It's still a blue screen. Ah, I came out to be in this kind of an area, to see the natural system still functioning. I come from a developed country where these things are virtually gone. There's no natural environment. I came out to see things like that. Let's take a boon viper right next to my house. To me, this is fantastic. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing what I do. But the other day, I was sneaking through the bush down near the edge of the water where gillnetters often hang out, and I saw a very rare sight. And being a trained scientist, I weighed up the options. It could either be Julius Malema visited Cozy Bay and didn't pop in for a cup of tea, or some of the resource users in the Cozy Bay area eat better, or at least more expensively than I do. They have better cell phones than I, have more spare cash than I, and yet, Ladies and gentlemen, they are breaking the law. They are destroying my heritage. And we are made out to the bad guys. So what I thought was, it's time to put the record straight. So the title of this talk is indeed, Subsistence versus Commercial Use and Abuse of Our Living Natural Resources. Okay, there's five main types of uh, resource use. True subsistence, what is true subsistence? It's usually essential. It's the basics of daily needs. It's your foods. It's, it's those kind of things. Nobody's going to take issue with that. The small-scale use, it's promoted by the government. It's trying to benefit people, build communities, develop. Nobody's really going to argue with that. Commercial use, like it or not, it's essential. It's part of the economy. We need to keep the economy of this country running. Recreational, have called it regulated and milked. It is regulated, and it is milked. They pay for it, and that payment goes back to help manage it. No problem. The illegal use, if our laws are sensible, and I think most of them are, they should be unwise and inappropriate to be illegal. To me, the problem is that Ezembello, us, correctly are bending over backwards to accommodate essential harvesting for the basics of survival, but the concessions that we've made to help those people are exploited wrongly for commercial gain. Basically, the new users are often relatively powerful people with employment, business, contracts, Sorry, I said contracts, uh, contracts, accidentally, I mean contacts, and exploit local politics. Examples of these are fairly simple and well known to us all. I've used fish here simply because we know a lot about it, it's in the public eye and there's a lot of information and a lot of money involved. Um, for example, if you look at the fish at Zini Dam, because all these situations we've got information on it, it's not that the information isn't there. In the Zini Dam, there is a large fish resource. Nobody's questioning that. It could be sustainably exploited in theory. But we've tried experimental fishing there. About 30 years ago, I had a full-time employee there looking at the fish, looking at gill netting, employing a local person to do gill netting to see what can be done. And the problem was that it caught the wrong species. We wanted them to catch tilapias and labios. They caught tigerfish. It was, a, it was a problem, and it was uncontrollable. You allow a person 100 metres of net, he doesn't use the 100 metres of net, he uses 500 metres of net. These are realities. And there is a, a legal alternative to the netting, rod and line fishing. Nobody's going to argue, and it's more or less legal, to fish rod and line anywhere in this province in the fresh waters free, and to catch what you want. And if you don't want to stick to the bag limits, that's fine, in my view, because you're not going to catch much more than the bag limits, and it is sustainable. And also in Jazini Dam, there's an important sport fishery for tiger fish. And that is increasing at the moment, it's developing, it's bringing in tourism, it's bringing in money and employment, and it's in direct competition with this large-scale illegal fishing. So basically, the gill netting from the past, from our investigations, it's unwise because it's unmanageable within the necessary constraints. Fishing in Duru. There's a lot of fish in Duru. But it's critical breeding stock for outside, because the reality is that the floodplain pans inside in Duma are only 10% of all the floodplain pans. And if you move outside, those floodplain pans are hammered every single day by netting, fornia, rod and line, everything. And the river itself is crisscrossed with gill nets the whole time. You try and canoe down it, you can't canoe down it, there's too many gill nets. So in Dumu is a sanctuary, and what does that mean? It means that uh, the breeding stock inside that reserve are protected. They can spawn, and then most of them are flood related spawning. When the floods come, the fish move upstream to repopulate the areas that have been heavily used. So, 
Protecting Ndumu stock is very good because it repopulates those areas outside. It's an essential sanctuary. If you look at Cozy Bay, we've got a heck of a lot of information, thank heavens. That's like 30 years of data. And you can look at it and go, wow, gee, this actually looks pretty good. We've gone from 40 tons of fish per annum up to 100 tons. But people have benefited under our management. Well, that's fantastic. However, we look at the last 10 years, we've gone from 100 tons to 50 tons. We've overexploited the situation. We're already oversubscribed. We've got stock decline. What does that mean? Tourism, employment are suffering. Food security of the local people who de depend on that wonderful protein are being threatened. There is no room whatsoever for poaching. Because those are basically the legal figures. You can imagine what's going on behind the back. Nobody's going to argue with the local people, recreationals or whatever, catching a few fish. What we do take issue with is that. Now that's a photograph of Cozy Bay fish, nearly all recreational fish, for sale. You won't see that today because there's not that many fish left. Um, okay, moving on. Examples of true subsistence. Wild fruit, some intertidal harvesting, mangrove crabs at Cozy Bay. But as Seavey said just now, when he was referring to that forest in Durban, only 10% of people collect fruit. Why? Because nobody wants subsistence use. Not the politicians, not the governments, not Isambello, not even the users. They don't want to be poor. They want to develop. They want money. Nothing wrong with that. Nobody's going to argue with true subsistence use. These young ladies collecting firewood inside Asimangaliso, no problem at all. It's dead wood, it's taken out in the head, it's essential for them, for their basic needs. But when they start chopping down trees for commercial use, wild fruit. There's absolutely no problem with people collecting wild fruit, but people don't really want to collect wild fruit these days. Real abuse. Three examples I'm going to get into, hopefully. Fish at St. Lucia. It's a massive situation. We've investigated the situation in the back uh, in the past. Uh, Oceanographic Institute, Bruce Mann carried out a study probably 20 years ago now. It's been published. There is no real traditional fishing in St. Lucia as opposed to Cozy Bay. There is no tradition of those people using marine resources extensively. As a result of the investigative fishing, we created um, uh, an experimental fishery and we made concessions to the local people to use nets but the concessions were exploited. Um, it's true to say that from a management perspective, they didn't find a single, not one single, complete illegal net. A legal net was 30 meters long with a tag attached. They found up to 700 meters with a tag attached. It's extremely difficult, but that's the reality. But because they weren't, well, because the, the conditions weren't being adhered to, it caused large-scale conflict and it became political. And Isambello ended up being portrayed in those days and even worse now as being unnecessarily restrictive. But the reality is that last year over a hundred kilometers of gill netting was seized and destroyed by Azimbello. Over 50 boats were destroyed and now there's intimidation, violence, threats and injuries on all sides. That's a surveillance photo taken a couple of months ago on the Bella Peninsula. I think there's 38 boats there. All illegal, all gill netting. That's gill netting. We took out 17 kilometers in one week. This is not sustainable. This is not subsistence. Uh, number two, let's look at wooden woodland. Um, the firewood along the roads is a serious problem. Upside down trees, carving. That's the Labombo wattle. That's an endangered species. Sold 1,600 bundles on the road the last time I counted. A tar road. That's the upside down trees. A huge embarrassment. It's not legal. It's there, but we can't stop it. That's outside St. Lucia. The wood carving industry. In some ways, it's an excellent thing. But are we brave enough to look into what species are used and where they come from? Medicinal plants, massive uncontrolled harvesting, localized extinction of some species, pepper bark and so on, outside the reserves. And the medicine itself is actually going to start running out soon because of the scale of the thing, because of the wastage of the thing. That's uh, what used to be a common onion wood. Now it's an uncommon onion wood. They take all the bark off as far as they can. They cut the tree down and strip the rest inside a protected area. Is there any hope? Yes, there is hope. Phew. But we've got to convince, the, we've got to get the politicians' attention and take it away from some other things. We've got to convince them that we have the information, there are examples, there is a way ahead. Thank you. We need to show that this is harming, this abuse is harming the people, the economy, the environment, everything. It's not just a bunch of greenies trying to 
enforce their will to be unnecessarily restrictive. We need to get high level support. In the past, um, our politicians came from a more advanced, not advanced, developed background. These days, we need to actually often get our leaders and take them from the beginning, step by step, so that they can understand what we're saying. We're coming in with scientific jargon and figures that they don't understand. I think that's why we're not getting through. So we need to build the process. We need to actually show them this kind of stuff because we've got the information, but we're not showing it to them. We need to, wherever possible, we talk about facilitating alternatives. The harvesting of natural wild resources, particularly in protected areas, really shouldn't take place, and certainly not commercially. We need to somehow facilitate alternatives. That's one of the biggest questions we've got. We need to do environmental education. Absolutely, it'll come up all over the place. And also, I mean, when you come into this province from the other provinces, on the road, on the signpost on the side of the road, zero tolerance. Well, I know it's zero tolerance. They caught me the other day for 51 kilometres in a 40 zone. Well, my view is, let's do that on the resource use front. The problem is that the abusers are getting political attention. The gill netters at St. Lucia marched on Matuba, handed over a memorandum of understanding, uh, sorry, a memorandum of dis misunderstanding, <laughs> A memorandum of grievances which are being addressed. Who's addressing them? What's coming back? In the meantime, the problem is worse than ever. In a surveillance flight the other day, they counted 101 illegal boats. And then a couple of weeks ago, tragically, a Mozambican citizen was killed by a hippo while illegally netting in St. Lucia. It's a massive issue. What is the solution? We need to shout louder than the abusers, than the people who are throwing criticism at us. We need to positively grab the attention of the decision makers and show them the information we've got. We've got the information, we need to get it to them. We need to convince those politicians. Those politicians are looking for votes, but they know the public are not stupid. And sooner or later, the public is going to realize what's going on, and if the politicians are seen as misleading them, they're going to lose votes. So we need to convince the politicians of that reality. We need to get buy-in from everybody. Very often we have troubles on the ground with the local SAPS, but we need the full support of the public, including the users, the SAPS, the media, and other users. Why must we act? Clearly, resources are being seriously threatened. It's on a massive scale, and any resource that's kind of left that's got any value is going to get picked upon. And if we don't stop them where they more or less are now, they're going to cherry-pick every single resource. There's going to be virtually nothing left. We will fail our children, and we'll fail ourselves. It's us who can actually make a difference at the moment. So the take-home message, don't do crime. Don't! I mean, I sit with a bunch of fishermen, and yeah, we need to actually check that each other don't boast of having sold fish or broken them by limit or whatever. Report all crime. If you see something happening, whether you cross the Guinea River or there's a gill net there or whatever, send the information through and do all you can yourself. Don't walk past a snare. A gill net's maybe a different thing. But if you're in the bush and you see a snare, take a damn thing out. Because reporting it to the authorities is probably not going to work. And don't let crime become accepted and acceptable in all your social groups. Quite frankly, to be political about it, whether it's speeding fine or whatever it is, don't do it and don't make it acceptable. Don't complain about other people being corrupt or whatever it is. Make sure you can make the changes that you can do. And we are indeed the good guys. We're not the bad guys. And I'm actually getting very tired of being tired of all time as the bad guys. And together, we can win. Thank you. <laughs>